I think we should go ahead and get started. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Ron Moldegak from the University of Washington, who's our today awesome speaker. And um, I just would like to say a couple of words about Professor Moldegak, who received his PhD in computer science from Stanford University in 1982, and has been at the University of Washington since 1985, where he's now a professor emeritus of applied mathematics. Professor Bodak is the lead developer of the Flow Pack and GeoFlow software packages and the author of several books on numerical methods for different equations. And I think many of our graduate students who take classes, at least took my class in numerical PDEs, use the book of Professor Bodak as a textbook. Uh, and current research interests are focused on algorithm software development, particularly for tsunamis and other geophysical flows, and the development of probabilistic hazard assessment techniques. Professor Lidak is a fellow of SIAM and the American Mathematical Society. Great, thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction, and thanks for the invitation to come here. It's always a pleasure to visit here. It's been several years, so I'm glad to be back. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is uh, some work on using adjoint methods for guiding adaptive mesh refinement for wave propagation problems uh, using finite volume methods. So uh, a lot of what I'll talk about is going to work with other people. In particular, I want to mention Risa Davis, a, a PhD student who finished this past summer, who was working on this as her main thesis project. Uh, Marsha Berger, the Prime Institute, I've been working with for many years, and she's been one of the core developers of the Qualpack adaptive mesh refinement software that we are using here, uh, and in particular has helped us a lot with this adjoint formulation. Um, but a number of other people have been involved in this software project over the last 25 years or so now that we've been working on CLAWPAC, which stands for Conservation Laws Package, um, which we started in 1994 as a package for implementing high-resolution shock capturing methods for conservation laws. Uh, now versions in one, two, and three dimensions with adaptive mesh refinement. Um, and the aspect that I've been mostly working on for the last 15 years or so is tsunami modeling, as I'll, I'll say a little bit about why that's so interesting to us in Seattle in particular. Um, but uh, there's a variety of other applications that have been <coughs> solved with this package. Pretty much anything that has a propagation you can solve with by modeling hyperbolic partial differential equations. And the methods we use are based on uh, solving a Riemann problem at interfaces between grid cells and then using the wave structure from that to update the grid cells on either side. So the, the idea of the software is if you have a Riemann solver for your particular problem, you can plug it in and, and solve the, the problem fairly generally. Um, so there are lots of applications where wave propagation problems arise. These are just a few of things we've looked at over the years. Uh, but again, I'm going to concentrate as a particular application on tsunami modeling both because that's what I've been working on mostly the last few years, and also because it's kind of a nice illustration of why we need something like an adjoint method to help us guide the adaptive mesh refinement. So um, there's a branch of the Clawpack software called GeoFlaw, which actually started out as Tsunami Flaw about 15 years ago. Dave George was a student working with me at the time, trying to get Clawpack to work on tsunami modeling. That was about the time of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, and the, since then there's been number of other devastating events, of course, and a lot of interest, in particular in Washington State, in doing a better job of preparing for future tsunamis. So this has kind of become a, a large part of what we've been looking at. So the idea of this software is that we can handle general flows over topography, um, shallow water equations, in two space dimensions, model the depth of the fluid and the horizontal momenta. And it turns out if you're looking at a, a tsunami on the ocean, the wavelength is often hundreds of kilometers, while the depth of the ocean is only about four kilometers on average. So even though we think of the ocean as being deep, it's actually shallow water compared to the waves that we're looking at. And so shallow water equations work quite well. Um, there's a number of things that kind of come into the software that are specific to this kind of flow over topography. Um, and we also have to keep it well balanced so that when you have a flat ocean at rest over Topography, it doesn't generate spurious waves, and all sorts of things come into the numerical method that I won't really talk about too much here. Um, but we've got that all working pretty well. And uh, in addition to tsunamis, the GeoCross software is now being used for solving a variety of other things. Dave George now works at the USGS Cascades Volcano Observatory on things like landslides and debris flows. Um, Kyle Manley, another former student out of Columbia, works on storm surge modeling. 
Um, other people have worked on submarine landslides, dam break problems, orca land flooding, that sort of thing. So I live in, Tsunami, in Seattle, which is right up here on the Puget Sound, Pacific Northwest, and offshore there's something called the Cascadia Subduction Zone, which runs from Northern California up to British Columbia. It's about 1,200 kilometers long, and there's a, a region where the oceanic plate is subducting beneath the continental North American plate, and this is happening sort of all around the, the Pacific, the Ring of Fire, as it's called, uh, and that's where you get these very big earthquakes occurring when the stress builds up at the interface between the two plates over hundreds of years, and then suddenly releases in the form of an earthquake. You also typically get volcanoes a little farther inland. So we have this Cascadia subduction zone, which uh, it turns out is active. For a long time, it was thought to be inactive. Um, and in fact, the last major earthquake was in 1700. So it was only sort of in the 1980s that people realized that in fact it was still active and that we have potentially huge earthquakes in this part of the world too. But now looking at evidence from past earthquakes, they determined that there's an earthquake roughly every 500 years or so, up to the size of a magnitude nine or so, something like the one that happened in Japan in 2011 or Sumatra in 2004. So it's really actually kind of interesting how they determine this. Next slide. Yeah, it shows a picture. This, this particular tsunami was well reported in Japan because it went across the ocean, it caused many deaths and a lot of uh, destruction of crops and things in Japan on January 26, 1700. But for hundreds of years, no one knew where the earthquake was that had caused that big tsunami. So it was called the orphan tsunami in Japan. And it was only in the 1980s that various people, including Brian Atwater, who's shown here at the University of Washington, and USGS, and a bunch of uh, other colleagues, many of them in Japan, kind of put together the evidence and figured out that this came from the Pacific Northwest. So in this picture, Brian's pointing, he's standing in a river that's in a, a bay near Seattle. And if you look at the bank over here, you can sort of see a notch running across here. And what that is is a, a tsunami deposit, a layer of sand that was laid down in 1700 when the tsunami came on shore. And at that point, it went over the, the marsh, it deposited a layer of sand, and then over the next 300 years, more marsh and ground built up on top of it. And so the reason there looks like a notch here is when the tide comes in in this area or when there's a big storm, uh, the water goes up that high and the sand grains get washed out more easily than the mud that's above and below it, and so you get this sort of notch. But if you dig into the cliff, you can see a very clear layer of sand in between the mud. And if you dig down in the ground here, you can see at least six or eight different layers of sediment from earlier tsunamis. And there's some places where they can find as many as 20 layers of sediment down below and date them with radiocarbon dating and other devices and figure out that on average over the last 10,000 years or so, there have been big earthquakes every 500 years on average, but with the big variance. So we really don't know whether the next one will be tomorrow or several hundred years from now, but there's a lot of interest in sort of preparing for it. So as I mentioned, we use the shallow water equations shown here in two space dimensions. So the, uh, I won't say too much about the equations, but it's conservation of, of mass. H is the depth of the fluid. HU and HV are the momenta components in the two horizontal directions. Um, if the right-hand side were zero, we'd have conservation momentum as well. The right-hand side involves derivatives of the bathymetry or the underwater topography that come into the momentum equations. And again, there's various issues that we have to deal with to solve these, but sort of the well balancing between the, the um, flux terms and the source terms in the case where you just have an ocean at rest. Also, we use Cartesian grid cells to model our flow with finite value methods. And so the shoreline is basically represented as an interface between where our cells are wet in the water and where they're dry on land. And as the water comes in and recedes, you have wetting and drying of those cells. So you have to deal with Riemann problems between wet cells and dry cells and decide how to handle that. So there's a bunch of interesting numerics in there. But the thing I want to focus on today is the sort of adaptive mesh refinement aspect of it um, and give you an idea of why this is important. 
this is a simulation of the 2010 uh, Tohoku earthquake off the coast of Japan. Um, and in this figure, I'm zooming in on New Zealand down here. The North Island of New Zealand has a harbor where there's a narrow opening where this tsunami was recorded as it went into the harbor. And so one thing we do with our tsunami model is try to validate it by comparing to data that's been collected in past events. So in this case, we get some data right here. And so we have to zoom in on this area at a very fine resolution. This is about a 10 meter grid cell resolution in this figure. Um, but we want to model the tsunami propagating all the way across the ocean. So we have to use adaptive measure time. And what you see here is that this is 15 and a half hours after the earthquake. We've really zoomed in on this part of the Pacific, but we have very coarse resolution elsewhere. In fact, you can't even see Japan. It doesn't even show up at this resolution, which I think was two degree on the side grid cells, which is about 200 kilometers. So we're going from 200 kilometer cells down to 10 meter cells, a factor of 20,000 refinement from the coarsest to the finest levels here. So again, we wanted to do that in order to see what's going on in this harbor. And if we zoom in on that, there were a couple of gauges, a floating gauge out here and a tide gauge in here, where there were actual observations of the water depth as a function of time, which are shown as the black curves here. And then the red curves are the actual simulation compared to that. And then right in the entrance, there was an ADCP, acoustic Doppler current profiler, that measured the currents going in and out of the harbor. And what's shown here is the east-west, the north-south components, and the total speed Again, comparing the, the numerics to the experiment. So we can actually do a pretty good job of modeling the tsunami, even propagating all the way across the ocean and into a, a narrow entrance like this by using adaptive measure time when appropriate. So if we go back to this figure, this was actually computed on a, on a laptop like this one, quad four laptop, in about three and a half hours of computing time. And almost all of that time was spent on this finest level grid, which covers a fairly large area, probably larger than we needed to cover. Um, but that's where all the computation took place. If we go back to an earlier time in the computation, say three hours after the earthquake, or even six hours after the earthquake, we're only refining around where the wave is. We haven't even started refining around New Zealand yet. And to get to this point only took about two minutes of computer time. So it's very efficient when we have relatively coarse grids out in the ocean. It's only when we start zooming in on the, the final location that all the time comes into play. So at about nine hours, so long, about three minutes of computing time. Finally, at about 12 hours, we start resolving uh, New Zealand, and then finally the harbor. And then computing time starts going up dramatically, 19 minutes to three hours or so to three and a half hours. So Adaptive mesh refining is really critical in order to do this sort of problem. You couldn't resolve the whole ocean at the sort of resolution we want at the final location. And we don't even want to be resolving the whole ocean at the resolution we use for the propagating waves. So we want to figure out which waves are really important to track across the ocean. For this particular problem, we were really interested in sort of the first wave that arrives at this harbor, so we weren't too worried about waves that might reflect off of distant coastlines. But here's another example where um, it's not quite so clear what ways you might want to refine. So this is a hypothetical earthquake off the Aleutian Islands. This is Alaska up here and the Aleutian Islands stretching down here. This is North America, a very close <coughs> resolution. Crescent City, California, which is, because of its um, topography around there, is typically hard hit by tsunamis, as indicated here. And now suppose we want to calculate the effect of this tsunami in Crescent City, then as it propagates, we clearly see a wave that's moving right towards Crescent City. We see these other waves, which are moving southward here. At this point, we might say, well, we can ignore those. If all we care about is Crescent City, let's just ignore those, stop refining that area. But if we go out further in time, what you see is that as we start refining down here, suddenly Hawaii appears. And northwest of Hawaii, there's a whole chain of leeward islands and an underwater sea ridge that acts as a very strong reflector. And so at later times, you get a reflective wave that also comes back and hits Crescent City at about nine and a half hours after the Earth. So if you really wanted to capture everything that's coming to Crescent City over this time period, you'd have to 
not only make sure you refine the direct wave, but also this reflection. And over longer time periods, there would be other reflections coming from other places. There tend to be edge waves that propagate up and down along the continental shelf, various other waves that come together at Crescent City. So this is sort of motivation for coming up with a better way to identify without having to go in and put in regions by hand, what parts of the wave do we have to refine at different times in order to capture what we're interested in, which is maybe the response at one particular location like this. Okay, so the adaptive mesh refinement we use is what's called often Berger, Kalela, Oliver style block structure refinement, which means we have grids at different levels, nested levels of refined patches, and at each level, we flag cells that need refinement to the next level by some criterion. That's the big question, how do we do that? And then those get clustered into rectangular patches, and those patches then recursively get flagged and clustered into refinement patches and so on. So there are various ways you can flag it. So one thing we often do for tsunamis as a first pass is just flag based on where the elevation of the wave is greater than some tolerance relative to sea level. So if we want to model all of the waves propagating across the ocean, that would sort of allow us to, <coughs> to expand our region of refinement as the waves go out. Um, but often we don't want to end up modeling the entire ocean at a tiny scale. So we have a capability where we can sort of specify particular space-time regions and say, over this region we want to allow only a certain level of refinement, or over this region near the coast we want to force a certain level of refinement after some time. Um, or you can try to do some sort of local error estimation, Richardson extrapolation kind of thing, but that would again only be looking sort of locally at what's the error at one point, not what effect does that have on some particular location farther away. So the adjoint method is what we're using to try to get a better handle on where do we have to refine in order to capture the waves that are going to reach some particular location at a later time. So Maybe not everyone's familiar with the idea of adjoint equations, so let's start with a very simple example from just linear algebra, and then we'll go to the time-dependent hyperbolic PD case. So the linear algebra version, suppose we just have a, a linear system, AU equals F. Think of A as being fixed, and F is the right-hand side, is the data, and for a given F, we can compute U by solving a linear system. But maybe we have lots of different right-hand sides that we want to solve this for. But also, let's suppose we don't really care about all of you. In the case of tsunami modeling, we don't care about the solution everywhere in the ocean. We only care about it at one point. So here, suppose we only care about the solution, not the full solution u, but some linear functional applied to you, some g transpose times u, where g is given a fixed vector. So that's what we'll call f, or p of f, rather. Some g transpose times u. So g might be a unit vector, which has only one non-zero which would be saying we, don't, we really only care about one component of you, not the whole vector. So if you're trying to determine this from this formulation, you have to solve the linear system and then multiply g transpose times u to pick out, or pick out the one component that you want. But if you want to do that for lots of different right-hand sides, you don't want to have to solve this linear system over and over again just to get one component of u each. So an easier way to do it is to instead solve this adjoint problem. So the original problem was AU equals F. The adjoint involves the adjoint or transpose of the matrix, A transpose, and it's a linear system, A transpose B equals G, where now G is the right, or the, the vector that defines the linear functional that we're interested in. And so this is a linear system of the same size as the original one, and we solve this once for this vector B, and then what we have is that the functional we're interested in, P of F, which is G transpose U, well, since G is A transpose B, G transpose U is just the same as B transpose AU, which is B transpose times F. So we get that P of F is simply B transpose F. So once we've solved this system once for B, we can compute P of F for any F by a single inner product. We don't have to solve linear system again. Okay, so that's sort of the magic of the, the transpose in this context of a linear system. Also, if we want sensitivities, suppose we want the derivative of phi with respect to one of the components of f, 
then we can just differentiate this equation p of f is d transpose f, which is just the sum of dj times fj, summed over j. We differentiate that with respect to f sub i, we get that dp dfi is just p sub i. So the elements of this adjoint solution b are exactly the sensitivities of phi with respect to each component of the data. So if you're doing optimization or an inverse problem, uh, you can calculate the gradient of phi of f directly from the spectra b. Okay, so that's the idea in linear algebra. Now let's go back to the hyperbolic PDE time-dependent problem. It's the same sort of idea, a little more complicated, but the same sort of idea. Um, and I'm looking at a linear system, variable coefficient perhaps, but linear, um, because for this problem of tsunami propagation over the ocean, even though we're using nonlinear shallow water equations in general, for the ocean propagation part, it's really a linear problem because the amplitude of the tsunami is tiny compared to the depth of the ocean. I'll say that at the end maybe about what would happen if you wanted to do the nonlinear part of transport on shore where things become much more complicated. But in terms of sort of guiding the adaptive refinement over the ocean, it's enough to look at the linear version. And here I'll restrict to just one space dimension. So Q is our vector with say n components. A is an m by m matrix with real eigenvalues so that Qt plus Ax equals Qx equals zero is a hyperbolic problem. And suppose we want to solve it at some time capital T with some initial given data. <coughs> uh, and let's keep things somewhat simple. Consider the Cauchy problem with Q containing zero of the boundaries so we don't have any boundaries in space to worry about. So this is the forward problem, solve for Q given um, some initial data. But now suppose we don't care about U everywhere. Suppose we only care about some functional applied to U similar to the linear algebra problem. Now the functional takes the form of um, some function G of X integrated against Q of X T uh, at our final time T integrated in space. So G of X is the given function corresponding to the G vector in the linear algebra problem. Um, so for example, in if we thought of this as being linearized shallow water equations, and what oh, we maybe don't care about the waves everywhere in our one-dimensional ocean, we only care about what's reaching one of our tight gauges somewhere on the coast, then this g could be a delta function. And so g integrated against q would just pick out the solution q at one particular point. The linearized shallow water equations, the q vector would be a vector with two components, the surface elevation and the linearized momentum, for example. And g might be a, a delta function in the first component and zero in the second. So the inner product of that with the solution would be the surface elevation at a particular point in space. Okay, so now the idea is, as in the linear algebra problem, let's define an adjoint that has the following property. So I'll call it adjoint function q hat of x and t. And this function, uh, we want to have the property that the functional that we're trying to evaluate, g of x transpose q of x t, this is our function g inner product with q at the final time. The idea is let's find an adjunct function so that q hat transpose against q at some earlier time, like our initial time, q t zero, gives us the same value p. So this would be sort of analogous to the linear algebra case where the, the solution b of the adjoint problem inner product with the data gives us the value of the functional without solving the linear system. Okay, so in this case, this adjoint function is going to have to be specified with some data coming from the function g that defines the functional that we're interested in. And the way this works, the adjoint is going to be a partial differential equation with a similar form to the original equation, except instead of solving forward in time, we'll have to solve it backwards in time because this function g that we're given in the functional is what we apply to q at time capital T. So our adjoint function at time capital T is going to be g of x. And then we'll look for an equation that allows us to propagate that backwards in time with the property that at any earlier time, q hat transpose times the forward solution at that earlier time also gives us the value of p. So we could propagate it all the way back to the initial time. 
So how can we come up with a function that has that property? Well, we can do our favorite thing of multiplying by a function, integrating, and then integrating by parts. Um, so we know that the forward equation is satisfied qt plus x 2 x is 0 at all times. So we can multiply it by this function q hat t, integrate in space and time, and we still get 0. And then if we integrate by parts, we have two terms here, one involves the t derivative, one involves the next derivative, so one will do the integration of parts in the time integral, the other one in the space integral. When we do the time integral integration by parts, what we'll find is that um, we have boundary terms, which look like q hat transpose q, integrated in space, evaluated between the initial time and the final time. And it's that term that's actually going to give us exactly what we want coming out of our adjoint solution. But then we also have to have the integral of q hat, time derivative of q hat times q, when we move the time derivative from q on to q hat. And similarly, when we integrate by parts in space, well, we normally have boundary terms, but I assume q goes to zero at the boundary, except plus or minus infinity, so that drops out, and we just have the double integral with the x derivative moved on to q hat transpose a. Okay, so that's just integration by parts, but if we rearrange that, and expand out this first term and move part of it to the other <laughs> side, then what we find is that q hat at time t, inner product with q at time t, is equal to q hat at time t0, inner product with q at time t0, minus this double integral, combining these double integrals. So if we could get rid of this red term, we have exactly what we want, namely that the functional, which is defined by the left-hand side, is also equal to the corresponding inner product at an earlier time. So now the idea is let's define our adjoint function so that this double integral drops out. And that leads to this definition here for the adjoint equation. It's simply saying that we have q transpose times this function, and we want that integral to be 0. So we'll just require that that be 0 at all x and t. And that gives us a partial differential equation to solve for the adjoint q hat. So this adjoint problem actually has a very similar form to the forward problem. It's also a hyperbolic variable coefficient PDE. The x derivative is on the a transpose times q hat. So if the, if the a is varying in space, it's inside the derivative instead of outside, but it's still a hyperbolic system. Um, a transpose has the same eigenvalues as a, so it still has real eigenvalues. And we have, again, q hat at time capital T, the final time, is given by whatever g of x we use to, to define our function. Do we yeah. have freedom alternatives? Do we, is that freedom operator because it's hyperbolic? It's not, um, isn't that the, if the heat equation kind of, you have finite dimension or is range is orthogonal to the curve of range of I think it's, uh, I think it's simpler than that in this case. It's just the fact that once we do this integration by parts, okay. our, we end up with exactly the same form, basically, except involving A transpose instead of A. And for hyperbolicity, we just need that the coefficient matrix has real eigenvalues. And since A and A transpose have the same eigenvalues, that's still going to be true. Very nice. Thank you. So again, this adjoint problem now has to be solved backwards in time with g of x being the, the final data, essentially, and moving backwards in time. But once we've done that, then we have this, this relation that our functional defined, that we originally defined by g and the forward problem at time t is equal to the adjoint solution at any earlier time in our product with the forward solution at that time. And so if we want to evaluate the value of the, the solution at some particular tide gauge, but change the earthquake source to some other source. We don't have to solve the full shallow water equations again in principle. We could just plug the new initial data, initial conditions data into this functional once we have the adjoint solution. Um, or if, again, if you want sensitivities, if you want to know how sensitive is the solution, the tide gauge record at Crescent City, say, with respect to changes in the source, if you're trying to invert for what is the right source to match some given tide gauge observations or if you're trying to figure out what potential earthquakes are most 
dangerous for a particular location, then you might want these sensitivities. Then you can essentially differentiate this E with respect to the initial data, Q at x t zero, and what you find is that the adjoint gives you that sensitivity existence. Or the application that we're interested in is, again, adaptivity. If we want to know where do we have to refine our forwards problem at some time t0, where t0 can now be any time between our initial time 0 and the final time we're interested in. At any time t0, if we want to know where do we have to refine so that we capture all the waves that are eventually going to reach Crescent City, say, then we can look at the inner product of the adjoint at that time t0 with our forward solution that we so far, and anywhere where that inner product is zero, we know the forward solution is not going to affect the value of Crescent City that we're trying to compute, so we don't have to refine that, area. and it's only where that inner product is large that we have to refine, so we can use some criterion, some tolerance to determine where to refine. Okay, so to sort of show how this works in one dimension, let's again look at the 1B shallow water equations. These are the nonlinear equations, but when you linearize about um, a steady ocean at rest, what you find is that you get this linear system where eta tilde and v tilde are sort of the linearized surface and momentum. And if we drop the tildes, we can write this as a linear system qt plus a at x qx equals zero, where a is this two by two matrix, and the eigenvalues are plus or minus the square root of g h bar, where h bar is really good. The, depth, the undisturbed depth of the ocean. And those are the, the standard wave speeds for shallow water waves. And you can also calculate the eigenvectors. So the, uh, if we call C the, the wave speed, square root of GH bar, uh, then the eigenvectors, the left going wave, one would mean speed minus C, has eigenvector one minus C, and the right going wave has eigenvector one plus C. So it's solving a hyperbolic problem that Eigenvalues give you the wave speeds, and the eigenvectors give you the relation between the different quantities in a purely left-going wave or a purely right-going wave. So in a right-going wave, for example, the, the momentum is just c times the amplitude. In a left-going wave, the momentum is minus c times the amplitude. The adjoint equation looks exactly the same, except it involves a transpose inside the x derivative, but it's essentially the same sort of problem. The eigenvalues are the same, but the eigenvectors change. They're now minus c1 and c1 are the eigenvectors, the right eigenvectors of A transpose, which are the left eigenvectors of A, which is important because being the left eigenvectors of A, they're orthogonal to the right eigenvectors of A. So for example, R1 hat is orthogonal to R2, and R2 hat is orthogonal to R1. <coughs> We'll see why that's important in a moment. So from this structure, you can easily sort of calculate the Riemann solution that goes into a finite volume method, for example. Um, and so if you apply that to a little 1D problem, this is a 4,000 meter deep ocean with a continental shelf that's only something like 200 meters deep, which is a sort of typical depth for a continental shelf as you approach shore. Although normally there would be some slope here, not just the sharp discontinuity, but to make the figures clear, we're going to have a, a sharp discontinuity in the depth at the, the edge of the continental shelf. And start with a tsunami that's represented as just a hump in, in elevation of something like 0.4 meters um, and with zero velocity. So what happens then is it splits into two ways, one going away from shore, one going towards shore. So the initial surface elevation gives you two waves. The one going towards shore, when it hits this continental shelf, it, since the wave slows down, it also shortens as it goes onto the shelf, and it deepens or becomes taller. You get this sort of wave shoaling effect. So this is the transmitted wave. And then there's also a reflected wave that goes back out towards the ocean. And in this calculation, the shore is represented just as a solid wall. And I actually put another shore at the other boundary as a solid wall. And so this wave, when it hits this wall, is going to reflect back and eventually go onto the shelf. This wave that's approaching shore will reflect off the shore. It comes back, it hits this interface, and then again, it's partly reflected back towards shore and partly transmitted out into the ocean. And if you go on longer in time, you get all sorts of waves bouncing around. 
rather than showing you it this way, let's switch to a sort of xt plot where this is x on the horizontal axis and time going upwards, and the red areas show where the wave is, is non zero, actually. So we started with a hump here that split into an outgoing wave and one going towards shore, which hit the shelf, and split into a transmitted and reflected wave. Then these waves reflect off of here and eventually come back onto the shelf. Is this the linear problem or the linear? Pardon? Is it the linear? So this is just the linear shallow water equation. But again, with these depths and this long a wavelength, linear is appropriate for this. So we have all these waves, and if we were doing a sort of standard adaptive refinement where we just tried to track where all the waves are, we'd be tracking all of these waves forward in time. But if we're if we've got a tide gauge up here, say, on the continental shelf, and we only care about what's happening there over this time period, then some of these waves clearly we don't need to refine. The ones that are headed off towards deep water at the end, we clearly don't need to refine. Depending on where our gauge is, we may or may not need to refine some of these other things. So let's suppose, for example, that we're interested only in the region where I have this dark black line up at the top. And to begin with, assume we're only interested in waves that reach there at this particular final time. Then we can solve this adjoint equation by taking initial data that's non-zero only in that region for our G function that we're going to use to make an inner product with the forward solution, and then propagate it backwards in time with this adjoint equation. And the adjoint equation, since it has basically the same form, it has basically the same sort of behavior. That way it splits into two pieces, one hits the boundary and reflects off, the other one heads out here. When they hit this interface in depth, they partly transmit, partly reflect. So you get a very similar pattern, but now going backwards in time. So what does this adjoint solution tell us? Well, again, we want to take the inner product of the adjoint with the forward solution, and it's only where that inner product is large that we have to refine the forward solution. So to put those together, let's overlay them. And now, what you see is that there are many places where one or the other is zero, and so the inner product is certainly zero. There's also places like here, for example, where the red forward wave is non-zero, and also the adjoint wave is apparently non-zero, but the red wave is moving off this way, so it shouldn't be important. Um, but even though they're both non-zero here, it turns out their inner product is zero because they correspond to waves moving in different directions for which the inner product of the eigenvectors is zero. So even waves that, even areas where both waves are non-zero, their inner product can still be zero. And it's really only the places shown here where the waves are sort of overlapping with each other, if you can see that, where the inner product ends up being non-zero. So the green area is the regions where the inner product is non-zero. And so what we see is that if we only care about what's going to reach here, and the only wave we need to refine is this one wave that gets transmitted, bounces offshore, gets reflected at the interface, bounces offshore again, and then reaches this point. Okay, so it helps us to sort of identify. So if we're solving the forward problem, and at each time taking an inner product with this adjoint, we can identify which parts of the forward problem we need to refine as we go forward. Is that clear? What is zero in floating um, point arithmetic? Yeah, so we have some tolerance. So we look at the inner product and we ask, is the inner product less than some value? And exactly what value to use is a bit of a black art still. We haven't, in this part of the work anyway, we haven't really identified a, a good way to set that tolerance. Um, and if you change the tolerance, then you'll potentially refine more areas that maybe didn't need to be refined. We've been looking at trying to combine this with the sort of error estimation, the forward error estimation using Richardson extrapolation where we solve on the grid we're using and then also on a coarsen grid and compare the two to get a local error estimate and then take the inner product of that with the adjoint to try to estimate the contribution of this local error to the final error at the point and then you can maybe try to choose a tolerance that's more related to what accuracy do you want in your final result. And we've got that working on some simple acoustics problems but for the full tsunami problem, the, the bottom topography is so rough that it, it, those error estimates aren't very good, so we don't have that fully worked. 
Do you have to store the adjoint solution in space and time, the whole thing? Yes. So that's so yeah, so if we want to be able to take this inner product, again, we have to start by solving the adjoint problem backwards in time, but then as we start solving the forward problem forward in time, we have to take the inner product with the adjoint at each time. And so you have to be solving the adjoint at least at some checkpoint times as you go along. And there are various complicated ways people have come up with to try to minimize or balance the computation and storage by maybe storing the adjoint at certain times and then when you're in some time interval resolving the adjoint equation over that time interval to get finer time. So far all we've done is we typically solve the adjoint problem on a much coarser grid than we're planning to use for the forward problem and we just save it every five minutes or something in the whole computation and read that back in at the beginning and use it. But that's something else that we'd like to improve in the future. And the other issue is that, again, we're assuming a linear problem so that we can solve the adjoint once and just use it. If you have a nonlinear problem, then you have to linearize about a particular forward solution. And if you then solve the forward solution to more <coughs> accuracy because you've done a better job of refining it, then you might have to resolve the adjoint problem about that new loop a linearization about that new problem, so you might have to iterate back and forth. But again, for what we're looking at, we're mostly interested in the, the waves propagating across the ocean where things really are linear. So we can solve this once and for all for a particular location like Preston City over the whole ocean and solve, save it on a fairly coarse grid, and then no matter where our earthquake source is, we can use that same adjoint solution taken across. Also, the other thing you might worry about is I assumed I was only interested in this particular location at this particular time, but if we have a tide gauge or we're interested in flooding at some location on shore, we don't care about just one particular time, we care about all time at that point. So if we were interested in some earlier time, we could do the same thing, but we want to start solving the adjoint equation at an earlier time backwards in time. But the adjoint equation is time invariant, it has spatial spatially varying coefficients, but it's invariant in time. So the adjoint solution starting at an earlier time is really just this adjoint solution shifted backwards in time. So once you've calculated this whole adjoint, you can shift it back in time to any earlier time. And so if we care about this high gauge location at all times, we can just, at any given time of the forward solution, take inner products with all adjoints uh, at all future times over appropriate time range see if any of them are above some tolerance, and if so, we know we need to refine it. So if we extended this region down in space-time a little bit farther, say we were interested in this rectangle, then we would take that, this blue adjoint solution and just shift it down to all times in that range and look at all those inner products with the forward solution, and then we find that there's not only this wave, but also this other wave that reaches that rectangle in the specified time. If we were interested in all times, we shift it down further, but in this case, we wouldn't find any additional waves that would put in that particular rectangle over this whole time period. Other questions? So that's basically the idea. Um, and so finally, I'll just show you how this can be applied to sort of the full problem and go back to that problem of the earthquake on the Aleutian Island subduction zone and how that might be modeled uh, as the approach to Preston City. So if we're interested in Preston City, what we would do is start by defining this adjoint problem, which is basically, again, the linearized shallow water equation, slightly different boundary <coughs> conditions at the shore, um, but it's easy enough to implement with the same software that we use for the forward problem, and start with a sort of a initial conditions that's like a Gaussian hump centered at Preston City, which is what we would take an inner product with to extract a sort of average value around Crescent City. Start with that as initial conditions for the adjoint problem and running that out backwards in time, essentially, that spreads out and gives waves that look very much like a tsunami propagating out from Crescent City. <coughs> and that's what we would be saving snapshots of at various times and then take the inner product of that with our forward solution of a tsunami coming from wherever, 
to see what parts of it do we have to refine in order to capture the waves that are going to reach the So this example, let's see. Start by looking at the upper left corner, which is the forward solution, just to remind yourself what happens here. Ignore the other two for the moment if you can, and then we'll go backwards in time and look at the head going. But solving the forward problem, we had this earthquake here, and we're interested in Crescent City. And what we saw was there's a wave that goes directly towards Crescent City and hits in about four and a half hours. And then there's this reflected wave off of the Leeward Islands that comes up here and hits after about nine and a half hours. Okay. So if we were interested in really just refining around the waves that are going to hit, say, at nine and a half hours, so just the reflected wave, forget about the direct wave, then what we would do, well, regardless of what we were interested in, we would start by solving this adjoint problem. So we put the, our Gaussian in Crescent City, and we'd solve the adjoint equation um, outward, oops, outwards, and the times I'm putting here on the adjoint plot is sort of the number of hours before the time of interest. So as we're going backwards in time, in essence, three hours, three and a half hours, four hours before the time of interest. And then the idea is that at each time as we now solve the forward problem, so we would first solve for this adjoint solution, and then as we solve the forward problem, at each time we would take our forward solution at say half an hour, and the ad inner product of that with the adjoint at time minus nine hours would give us the waves that are going to reach Crescent City at nine and a half hours. And what's shown up here in the upper right corner is the inner product of the forward and the adjoint at complementary times that add up to nine and a half hours. And so what you see as you go forward in time again is that this wave that's headed right towards Crescent City doesn't show up at all in this inner product because we're only looking at the wave that's going to arrive at nine and a half hours. So this tells us we don't really have to refine that wave at all. But it's saying we do need to refine these waves that are going off this way, even though it looks like they're going to miss Crescent City altogether, because later on they'll reflect and come back. So at later times, we see that all we have to refine at six hours, for example, but well, clearly we only have to refine things that are sort of in a circle distance three hours away from Crescent City. But the adjoint is giving us more information than that. It's telling us sort of within that circle, what waves do we have to refine in order to capture the ones that are actually converging on Crescent City at that point. So that's the idea. And we've been doing some experiments recently. We have a project with the NOAA Center for Tsunami Research, which creates the uh, software that they use in the, the tsunami warning systems all around the Pacific. And they're interested in potentially using some of our software in the future. So we have a project with them to look at tide gauge data from four different past tsunamis, including the Hoku event in Chile 2010. Um, there was one in Haida Gwaii, up north of Seattle, and one in American Samoa, I guess I told you before. And look at a whole slew of tide gauges around the Pacific where there was data gathered, and look at how our prediction from those events at those tide gauges compare with the software they're currently using. So we had a huge set of problems to do. Some of them had to be solved out to 12 or 18 hours of simulated time to capture all the waves that were seen on the tide gauge. And so this adjoint was really instrumental in kind of helping us to guide the adaptive refinement for all of those runs and get that project done. But we're using it fairly routinely for other things now too. Um, so I kind of focused on this idea of guiding the adaptive refinement, but there are various other things that one can use it for, in particular um, well, identifying sort of what combination of waves are coming together at a particular time to give a particularly large wave. Often it's not the first tsunami wave arriving that's the biggest, it may be the fourth wave, and people don't always understand why the fourth wave is so much bigger. Um, and sometimes it's a combination of reflections and edge waves moving along the continental shelf. This can kind of help determine as we just saw what waves will arrive at a particular time. Um, also maybe the sensitivity analysis of what earthquake regions are most dangerous for a particular location in terms of the tsunamis they generate. And also if you're doing inversion, rapid inversion, they have to quickly figure out from measured observations how the earth moved, what created the tsunami, and so that's an inverse problem that has to be solved rapidly based on data. And again, you can use the adjoint 
the sensitivities that come out of it to, to help guide uh, conversion. So if you're interested in, in uh, this, it's all open source software. The adjoint isn't yet merged into the Clawpack 5.5, which I think is the version that's out now, but it should be merged into the next version of the adjoint uh, stuff. Uh, in general, if you're interested in following what we're doing, it's all on GitHub. Uh, we have a paper from a couple years ago that sort of describes our whole sort of philosophy of development and how we've been doing a lot of things in relation to this project. And so most of the uh, most of the papers we have also include the code that goes along with them to, to try to reproduce some of the experiments we've done. These are a few in particular that relate to, to this work. I'll be happy to answer any other questions. The shift you do with the adjoint solution, with that, um, is still the regional for like a nonlinear? Yeah, so if it's nonlinear, again, the problem there is that you have to, the adjoint is really a linearized problem, and so you have to linearize about a particular forward problem. Here we're looking at a case where no matter what the tsunami is, the, the ocean at rest is a good case to linearize about to get the adjoint. But if you were looking, for example, at waves coming on the shore, then it becomes highly nonlinear. And if you were interested in, say, um, a point onshore that the waves reach and trying to, say, do a, a conversion to try to match the data best at that point, then if you just use this linearized about the ocean at rest, that point would be dry and there wouldn't even be shallow water equations there to solve the adjoint equation with respect to. So you really have to solve a forward problem that gave you some water at that point before you even linearize and solve an adjoint problem. <laughs> and so you'd really have to kind of iterate in order to do anything with that, and that would get much more complicated. So it's, it's pretty possible in principle, but we haven't done it. But with nonlinear problem, when you do a joint and you solve that towards the time, if you have shocks, right, then the solution is not unique. Then at certain point, you cannot. Yeah, but the adjoint is always a linear equation. Even if your forward problem right. is nonlinear, you right. linearized about something. But then when so, you go back along the linear, you don't. Yeah, so, it, yeah, so your you linear shock, problem. You don't, you don't have a unique solution when you go back, right? The uh, so, yeah, so the linearized problem going backwards would then have like a discontinuity right. of coefficients because the coefficients right. you know, right. come from the, the wave heights and the, and the forward problems. So, so you could have potentially issues, although I mean, we have discontinuities in the coefficients already like that mm -hmm. idealized continental shelf that was a discontinuity in the symmetry. And it, you can handle that perfectly well. You just have reflection and transmission that sort of gets handled properly by the Piedmont solver thing. Different materials. I think the same is true even if you were going backwards and also calculating forward solutions. But it may not be. Um, it certainly be more work to solve a non right. problem. Other questions? Well, how sensitive are your, your results to the amount of information you have on the uh, bottom topography? Um, yeah, so in terms of bottom topography, I mean, we definitely need a reasonable representation of, of the seafloor. And we have a, a resolution of like two kilometer over the whole ocean. It's part of like the Etobo one data set, for example, like here is even 30 arc second, which is about one kilometer resolution data. And that's more than enough resolution for tsunamis that are you know, maybe 100 kilometer wavelength again. Of course, you get shorter wavelength stuff going on with all of the reflections and whatnot. But over the ocean, we're typically refining down to a level of maybe um, I think maybe one arc minute to thirty arc second at the most. So sort of consistent with the resolution we have in the bottom corner. So it's not really a, a problem in the near field on the onshore as the waves come onshore. If you want to really model inundation of an area, we need much higher resolution data like. Ideally, well, most of the areas of Washington coast that we're doing now, we have 10 meter resolution. Uh, some areas they're starting to collect data that's at more like a three meter resolution, one ninth of a second or something. And that's even better, um, but we don't have that everywhere yet. But even, even the one third of a second or 10 meter resolution is, is adequate for doing most of the innovation modeling. Any questions? Uh, I was wondering if in the equations you use, it only had like an advection component 
uh, would you the same be applicable in other applications where you have also a diffusion part? Yeah, so if you have a diffusive equation, um, we haven't really looked at that since Clawback is designed at hyperbolic problems. Um, you can do the same sort of approach, but I, I'm not really, haven't really thought about exactly what carries over and what might be different when you try to. Like generally, diffusion equations and they are not time invariant. You can't solve them backwards. Uh, like if you look at like Right. Yeah. You, yeah. You. Yeah. You wouldn't get just the backward heat equation and say that as your adjoint equation. If, if so, you'd be sunk because you can't solve that. <laughs> Somebody else maybe is looking more. You always equation. solve adjoint equation backwards, even yeah. if it's for the hyperbolic. Yeah. Uh, hyperbolic. Okay. Yeah. Let me just ask you one more question. Uh, the adjoint equation. The kernel is finite dimensional or infinite dimensional because, um, because usually the forward equation, the range is orthogonal to the kernel of the adjoint equation. The advantage of adjoint equation is the kernel is finite dimensional. So then the range of forward equation is co-dimensional finite. Of course, this is with diffusion. Okay? Right. So I'm not familiar with moving <laughs> <laughs> removing the diffusion. And I'm not so familiar with adding. So <laughs> we're, we're sort of our talking. But the adjoint is always solving backwards by definition. But here you don't have a problem, I think, because if you have a finite speed of propagation in hyperbolic problems. So it's always finite. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, the, and the propagation speeds are the eigenvalues, right. which so are the same, same for the transpose matrix. Yeah. What, what role does dispersion play in these? Because the. Uh, yeah, so dispersion, yeah. Uh, as I was mentioning, yeah. Earlier, for shorter wavelengths, right. shallow water equations are not so adequate. Uh -huh. For these very long wavelength tsunamis that come from big subduction zone earthquakes, they're, they're quite accurate. But we've also been looking at things like asteroid impact tsunamis, where you can get waves where the wavelength is only one or two kilometers, which is less than the depth of the ocean. Or landslide generated tsunamis, as happened in Indonesia recently. Um, for those, Types of tsunamis where the wavelength is short compared to the fluid depth, you really have to add dispersal terms, and so you get you use Kuznetsky equations or something like that. But it still would be. We minimum, haven't actually so, yeah. even thought about how this would extend <coughs> to to say Kuznetsky equations. We're at the moment we're trying to get Kuznetsky equations working together with our adaptive metric model, which in itself is a bit of a hassle because the Kuznetsky equations involve third order derivatives, so you have to use implicit methods. And our adaptive refinement currently is based on the fact that we're doing yeah. everything explicit for hyperbolic equations. So once we get that working, we'll be able to get the engine. Okay. Well, you also had time involved in those particular Kuznets. Right, it's like a TX. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's actually, yeah, we do it with a kind of splitting where it's really a elliptic equation. You're solving oh, each right. time for an update to the time group. So, so actually, they make a change of variables like something minus UXS. Which equation is solved, and then right. you have only the propagation. Yeah. And does it make sense but to it's add still a coupled system if you don't have to right. solve for those equations. But does it make sense to add uh, other terms to show water than the like Coriolis forces or. Um, so, Coriolis terms turn no. out not to be very important for tsunamis because the fluid velocities in the ocean are tiny, even though the, the tsunami is going fast at right. 200 meters per second over the ocean, or like a mile an hour or something. but the Fluid velocity is tiny um, as the fluid particles go back and forth as they get by. So the Coriolis terms, we, they're included, and you can turn them on, but we usually have them turned off because of all the tests we've done say they can other people to it, and we found that they just don't do it. Well, just as a follow-up, what about tides? Tides, oh yeah, that's a very good question, and something else that we're, <laughs> we're, is on our list of things to tackle. So yeah, so for propagation across the ocean, the, the tide doesn't really much matter. But once you come into a harbor, then it can matter a lot. And in particular, like that harbor in New Zealand that I showed you, that was actually part of a, a benchmark problem from a workshop on tsunami currents and tides. And, and part of the problem was to actually look at also the tidal currents going through that channel and how they were interacting with the tsunamis. And some groups have been tackling that. We haven't yet got that built into the geothermal code. Um, but it can make a big difference. In, in some regions, if the tsunami is coming in with the tide or opposing the tide, you can get very different both currents in the harbors and different distance of inundation. Mm -hmm. So that's something we can adjust the sort of a static tide level so we can look at it coming in at high tide or at low tide, but we don't have it interacting with tidal 
sorry, I had another question. Uh, so when you showed the example for the Crescent City, you arrived at a time frame of 9.5 hours. So how do you arrive at, how do you arrive at that? Uh, the, at that, that, time at that 9.5, yeah, so that was just an example sort of to show, you know, what would, what would this look like if we were interested in the solution at this one particular time, nine and a half hours. So this would be like an application where we're trying to figure out, you know, which wave is it that comes in at the big signal at nine and a half hours? Where did that wave come from? This would sort of help you identify, well, is this reflected wave or in more complicated cases it might be a combination of two reflections that come together at the same time or something. If we were just trying to get the best record we could over all time at this point, then at each time in our forward problem, we would actually want to take an inner product with every one of our adjuncts, or at least over some time range, so that that would give us which waves can arrive at any given later time in that location. But by, because we have the adjoint solved, saved at, at every time, fairly coarse times on the coarse grid, but we do have it saved over the whole time range, we would take the inner product with, with each of the adjoints. So, kind of in the scope of inverse problems, can you, I'm guessing, you have multiple data sources so you can do this whole adjoint backwards from the data source. Can you also use this to help with optimal experimental design for you know, mismatch and what you're predicting and you want to use what you're missing in data sources to kind of complicate that? Yeah, certainly adjoint equations are used for exactly that sort of thing, design optimization. We haven't used it for that, but when there is potential way propagation Applications for that could be used. Other questions? You can also add. Let's thank you.